Welcome to another episode of Quartziders. I'm your host, Eric. With me, I have Dimitri. Hello, guys. Welcome to another wonderful, what is it today? Today's Monday. For today's episode, we actually have the first version of our mock draft for the upcoming NBA draft, which Dimitri has nicely set up for us. And we have to congr- congratulate the Detroit Pistons for winning the lottery, first of all, because that was kind of like a miracle. Were you expecting to win the top five, Dimitri, as a Sacramento Kings fan? I was not expecting to uh, win the top four, unfortunately. Uh, I Honestly, like, I was expecting to win the top four with one of my teams, but I kind of deep down knew it wasn't going to be the Kings because the league wasn't going to give us another one after we fucked up Doncic so bad. You know what I mean? So, yeah, like, I knew it was going to be one of my teams, like the Raptors or the Kings were going to jump just because the odds were, like, too high for it not to happen. But yeah, no, yeah. I'm happy to see the Raptors jump up because I think their development system can probably do more with one of those top props prospects. Yeah, probably. So do you, how mad do you think Sam Presti was that he tanked the whole season and got the number six pick? Uh, I think he may have, may, may have broken a desk. We, we will see, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I think it's definitely, he definitely let a long exhale out of his nose for sure. Just of like sheer disappointment. He probably put his hands in, 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 in his head, in his hands. And he was just like, let's go back at it next year. <laughs> Cause I yeah. think OKC, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure OKC loses their pick next year if it's not in the lottery. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see OKC give it one more year. Cause I think after, I think after that they're good to go and like start competing because their picks are all safe. But I think until then, I think OKC will be tanking again next year. I wouldn't be surprised anyways. Tank season, baby. So yeah, um, let's go right into it. So for the first pick of the 2021 draft, the Detroit Pistons will select... Jalen... No, (laughs) Kate Cunningham, of course. Um, I mean, there's no question here that it's going to be Kate Cunningham, right? Kate, Kate's the most talented prospect on the board. Don't mess this up. I know you guys are smoke screening with Jalen Green. I don't believe one second of it, guys. You know what? It, it's not believable. All right. Y'all are taking Cade. It was announced like after you got the first pick that Cade had one meeting. It was with the Detroit Pistons. Like, they're, don't beat around the bush. We know what's happening. Cade's going number one. He's the best player. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there has been a huge push, I think, by the Jalen Green squad PR team about um, how good he is and how good of a worker he is and how dedicated he is. I think I read an article today of him comparing comparing himself to like Kobe Bryant, which I would say is a reach, especially for Jalen Green, even though he is a great, great talent and he's probably he is a top five talent. So, but He's still, it's a reach. So with the second pick, the Houston Rockets choose. So I think the Rockets should take Evan Mobley. That's the first thing I want to get out of the way before I go ahead and make the selection. They should take Evan Mobley. The the difference between Evan Mobley's defense and Jalen Green's defense is significantly larger than their offensive gap. Flat out. Mobley has the chance to be just this generational talent. And I think also people just aren't looking at it in the sense of like, which player archetype is considerably more valuable. I think a guy like Mobley can actually change your franchise. You know, uh, this big body center who can, who can, who's kind of a unicorn, honestly, in his own sense. I know people haven't been calling him that really, but Evan Mobley has the potential to be a unicorn where he's just this giant that can create shots from anywhere on the floor and just defend at an elite level. And Jalen Green isn't, uh, like, obviously that archetype that he possesses isn't that. It's not nearly as valuable. It's more of a high-scoring shooting guard with poor defense and just bad feel on that end, right, that can give you a bucket whenever you need it. But is that necessarily an archetype that has led to NBA success when you don't have talent around it, right? Like, you look at Beal, you look at – and he hasn't really had that much success when it was just him on the team. Uh, you look at Booker, who's been looking for that surrounding cast for years now and 
finally just got it. And then you look at Levine, who's still looking for that supporting cast. All three of these guys are like decently, you know, comparable in in some ways to Jalen Green. And they still have a lot of trouble finding their own success without a solid team built around them. In my belief, an archetype like Jalen Green, a very high scoring shooting guard or defensive feel is something that can raise the ceiling of your team, but not necessarily its floor. So that being said, when you really just need talent, you're one of the worst teams in the league, like Houston is, I would absolutely take Evan Mobley here. But just from all the reports we've seen and everything we've read, I'm going to have to give them Jalen Green. Yeah, and for I think that's disappointing on my end because I'm a big Evelyn Mobley fan. Uh, I do think there's a reason why these teams are in the final right now, and I think it definitely centers around some of the big men, right? I think if Giannis was in on the Milwaukee Bucks or even Brooke Lopez, who saved them in a couple of these games against Atlanta, uh, or DeAndre Aiden, who has had, a, I think, like a great playoff run so far, and I think you look at the other teams, they all have kind of this bigger than life player. That's not, uh, I guess it's a metaphor because they are pretty big themselves. But as you said, Houston has a deficit for talent. So I could see them taking Jalen Green and making that mistake. But also like you look at Evan Mobley and I think people were saying like, whoa, how does he fit with Christian Wood? Like, bro, believe me, no one gives a fuck. Both of them can shoot. And yeah, like, like, honestly, like... It, they're, they're, they, I think, frankly, I think they're a good fit together. I'll go ahead and say it. I like the idea of having two absolutely giant guys that can shoot the ball and create their own shot a little bit. I think Evan can make up for Wood's defensive deficiencies. I, I don't see any reason why both of them can't function on the floor together. I, there's no spacing issue. So w- what's the problem here, guys? Yeah, and I think uh, the KPJ Jalen Green would be pretty fun, in all honesty. I mean, the defense wouldn't be there, but, you know, the offense would be highlight. So um, we'll move on to number three, which is the Cleveland Cavaliers. Obviously, Jalen Green and Cade go first and second, respectfully. And then you have Evan Mobley here. Yeah, I mean, this three. couldn't be the most obvious. This This is the most obvious pick ever, right? Like... They just, they need someone, they need a big, uh, ideally he'd be playing power forward here next to Allen. They'll give it a try. I don't know if it'll work necessarily, but it could be just because Evan Mobley, you know, definitely does need to evolve the shot a little bit, expand on it, but also a coral can't really shoot and nor can Allen. So both of those guys are like, they would all have to improve their shot. Cause I just don't know if sex land is enough of a countermeasure spacing wise to make up for how much you're going to be missing. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, it'd be interesting seeing him at power forward and Allen at the center position. I think, yeah, the coral thing, he doesn't really, you know, he can't really shoot well, even though Allen does have a good uh, field goal percentage. He's not like doing jumpers or shooting threes. Um, he was shooting threes this year, but We'll see. I mean, the Cleveland Cavaliers team this year was kind of a wash, uh, minus some games uh, in the beginning of the year. So it was a. It would be a wonderful defensive fit. Uh, as much as I have just you know kind of weighed on the offensive fit and the problems with it defensively, it does make a ton of sense for Cleveland. So and it, it you just take the best player available when you're in a situation like Cleveland or Houston or you know any of these teams that are at the bottom of the league. You just got to take the best talent available, and that's what Mobley is at three by far. Yeah, I agree. So we'll go at number four, your Toronto Raptors. Who And like, for number four, I mean, the top four in this draft has been pretty solidified. I think everybody kind of knows this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to see the same top four everywhere. Some, some people try and be different and they put Scotty Barnes in their top four. Like, nah, man, like it's obviously going to be Jalen Suggs here with Kyle Lowry leaving. This just makes way too much sense for the Raptors. He's a guy who can step in and be a great defender. And, you know, the Raptors have had history of making guys with quite like who need a little bit of help on their shot. They've made them better, man. They, they, they turned OG into a guy that was like very, very questionable shooter coming into the league into a guy who's shooting 40%, I believe now. So I believe they'd be able to work the same magic with Suggs and his shot making potential. And he's already got the defense the Raptors would love. So uh, this is a match made in heaven. Yeah, definitely a good match for uh, Toronto, Nick Nurse, Masai, 
And the Raptors um, always, they, they love guys in the draft that come generally from winning programs. I mean, you saw that with Malachi Flynn last year and how good San Diego State was. And I mean, how perfect of that, how perfect for Suggs just to come right to them. Uh, one of the guys who was, I mean, one of the, literally one of the best college teams this year. So, No, it makes sense. And, you know, half court game winning shot doesn't, doesn't hurt your stock, especially in this year's draft. Uh, let's go to number five, which is Orlando Magic. You have Scotty Barnes, Florida State. Yep. Yep. And this might be the first little hot take of the board, but I, I do think that Scotty Barnes has a better case to go number five than Jonathan Kuminga, uh, considering what Kuminga showed in the G League. I, you know, Kuminga has some definite questions on what he's going to be able to do and do and not do in the NBA, especially. People have a lot of concerns with how is he's going to move with his knees. People have a lot of concerns about uh, his passing in the sense that he generally could only make passes that he's looking at for quite a while. Like you don't really see that many no looks or like spatial awareness kind of thing. The shot is still a huge question. I think he wasn't even shooting that well in his solo shooting drills right now. So it, it, there's a lot of big question marks involving Jonathan Kuminga, but the, I, I think the Magic just should take Scotty Barnes, considering how how monstrous that could be on defense with Jonathan Isaac. Jonathan Isaac is somebody that I believe could still play the three or the five next to Scotty, and you could play those two together and just have an absolutely terrifying defensive core already, especially with Wendell there too and Mo Bamba and just Okiki. They have they have a lot of length and they have just a lot of options when it comes to the defensive end. True, but they still don't have a coach, you know, so I think it could be interesting if they choose someone without a coach, which I don't think it's going to be possible, but um, no, there's no way that doesn't happen. So yeah, hopefully they choose. I think, I think they were interviewing um, the assistant coach in Milwaukee. I believe I think it was his second interview. Was it Unsold? I don't know. Pretty sure it was him, though. Like, I, who was interviewing Unsold, sir? I think the Orlando, Ma- Orlando Magic or were interviewing him. Yeah, there, there, there have been a few teams that have uh, given Unsold a call. I know there's a team that's, like, settling into it right now. I read that today. They had their finalists, I believe. There's, yeah. And, yeah also uh, Washington. Magic. Yeah, Washington's search. So Washington's finalists are Jamal Mosley, Dar- Darvin Ham, Char- Charles Lee, and Wes Unseld. So Wes Unseld is going to be a hot name in the coaching market. He'll probably end up on a team next year. Yeah, especially because, you know, finals. So, um, yeah, so number six, obviously, you have Kaminga at six with OKC uh, coming in at number six. Yeah, I mean... OKC would want the swing pick here, right? If you want, if you're OKC, you'd take the guy that could end up being absolutely amazing and absolutely stellar. And OKC does sort of, they just want the the best talent on the board. And I think Kuminga, while he isn't my, my number one talent on the board, I think a lot of teams will consider him the best guy available. They'll see what could be done and i think there is there's a real case for kuminga Uh, i think people are being a little too harsh on him in the sense that like he actually his first five games if you go back and look in the g league and watch those games his first five games were pretty solid and then he he did get injured and that's sort of where the stats started to fall off for kuminga so that is one thing i kind of want to note with him so we'll move on to number seven the golden state warriors choosing Moses Moody from Arkansas. Yeah, Moses makes a lot of sense here. I mean, not only do Warriors fans seem to want Moses in masses right now, he's had an interview with the team, uh, which has been reported. Uh, He was spotted at San Francisco Airport yesterday. That's my Kang's draft source right there, baby. Uh, And he is just kind of a perfect future fit, I think, with their core. I mean, you look at a guy, you're looking at a guy who could eventually slot in as the three next to Clay and Curry, and he's going to be a guy learning from the two best shooters in the entire NBA. I I just couldn't think of a better situation for Moses to come into. 
and just absorb, just absorb all the information around him. Just a perfect future fit, but also just a perfect fit for him to learn the game right now. So that's why I'm a big fan of Moses Moody to uh, the Warriors. I think the pick makes a lot of sense. Realistically, obviously, the Warriors are probably going to trade this pick. But if they were to stick around at number seven, Moses Moody definitely makes the most sense. And oh, then- and another thing I wanted to note with OKC is just that they do kind of needle forwards a little bit more um, because Shea... They have Shea and they have Dort and they have Maladin and they have their guards kind of set. So taking Kuminga makes sense for that. Just forget to tack that on. Gotcha. Um, So we'll move on to number eight, which again is the Orlando Magic. And you have them choosing your boy. My boy, my one of my least favorite prospects this year, uh, James Booknight. You know, for as much as I rag on James Booknight, he is a good contested shot maker. He's uh, somebody who has a lot of uh, skill to break down his defender. And he's a guy that the Magic kind of need just a bucket. Let's be honest here. They kind of just need a guy who can score off the dribble. And I believe Book Knight took like nine uncontested jumpers all year or something like that. So they weren't obviously going to take a forward here considering or a center. They have Mo Bamba and they have Wendell and they have... Isaac and they have Okiki and they have Barnes so it didn't really make sense for them to grab another forward or a center so I I have them taking the, the that big shot making guard which is something they've lacked forever to be honest with you that is true so we'll move on to Sacramento and you have them choosing Franz Johnson Franz Fre- Johnson freshman from Duke Michigan. Yeah, France. No, if, if I, I mean, I said this on Twitter this week, it kind of, I, I have my first viral tweet, but man, if the Kings t- take Jalen Johnson, I'm just shutting down Kings draft. Or sorry, if they take Franz Wagner over Jalen Johnson, I'm just shutting down Kings draft. There's no point in like actually following the team anymore. So w- were you like happy or sad that it went viral, even though oh. like the impl- like the implemented thing was like, I will delete this account. Yeah, this I, I find it hilarious that my biggest tweet by like a hundred likes now is about me quitting the platform. I find that fucking hilarious. I, I, I see the humor in it personally. I can I can laugh at myself here on this. I I, I think it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> I think I made a respect quote tweeted it and I was like, thanks guys. But like no, it's it's just, man, it's such an obvious pick here. If Moses Moody and Scotty Barnes are off the board, this is such an obvious pick for the Kings. And I, I know Monty McNair likes him too. That's the thing. Because there have been a lot of Kings fans, um, because we've been to the lottery so many years and stuff like that. And we, we've gone absolutely bananas. And we're trying to figure out who our team is going to pick even before it happens. So there's a guy that went out and he looked at like every single pick that the Kings have made um, since Monty McNair has been GM, but also Monty's previous picks that he's made. And one thing he noticed is that there's a tendency with Monty where he actually likes to pick guys that have steal and block percents above 2%. And the other factor, he's, keep in mind, Monty McNair is a very analytics-based GM, right? So the, the, and the other factor was, la- at least for last year's prospects, it had to be 2% steal block percent. And 40% from three. Volume didn't seem to matter because Robert Woodard had pretty low volume. But yeah, those seem to be his characteristics. So when you look at those characteristics and you look at the prospects available, it's basically like Jaden Springer, Jalen Johnson, and Chris Duarte. So I think it's, I mean, to me, it's pretty obvious that the the Kings should take Jalen Johnson here. Not only is he the best talent on the board, but he makes the most sense considering the past draft criteria we've seen from uh Monty McNair our GM as for the roster fit I mean we just need we need that defensive presence man so some people have you know some questions on how he'll uh his technique in guarding pick and rolls and his 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 boxing out and his engagement level but when he is on he is a really good secondary rim protector and he is a really good like uh, he's just good at help like helping on defense and with something we've needed for so long is that secondary rim protector. You go look at Harrison Barnes. I'm pretty sure Harrison Barnes is averaging 0.2 blocks on the season or something like that. It's, it's pathetic, you know, and Holmes needs that guy that's going to be able to provide that help at the rim when he's not going to make it or the guy that's going to be able to at least keep a guy on his hip and protect. It's, it's very important for us to get him. Um, 
So I, I think him and Holmes would be a fantastic fit defensively. And if we want to move forward, even, you know, we could play him at the four, Bagley at the five. And then we got our backcourt and Tyrese and Fox. And if we're bad for one more year, which I expect to be because we kept Luke Walton, then we can keep, we can get someone in 2022. And that's, that's a good future roster right there. If we move Bagley to the five. So gives us something for the future. It gives us something for the now with Holmes. I'm a big fan of Jalen Johnson. He's number uh, six or seven, uh, probably seven on my board at the end of draft on draft night. Nice. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Jalen Johnson. Let's see. Let's hope he lasts till number nine. Uh, talking about number nine, let's go on to number 10 with the New Orleans Pelicans choosing Josh Gede from down under from Australia. Okay. What do you think about Josh Giddy? You know, Josh Giddy is probably my least favorite international in the first round. Um, but I do think he makes some sense on the Pelicans, especially if Lonzo's on his way out and they do need that big playmaker. I mean, Giddy is a special playmaker. Don't get me wrong. It's just I have some questions involving his handle and his shot. And I have some big questions involving his defense. So it's kind of where I'm at with Giddy. It's, it's you know, he's not the perfect fit on the Pelicans, but it's also who else are you going to take? Like I considered Garuba. I considered Keon. Not a big fan of Keon for the Pelicans. Just doesn't provide, you know, any spacing or anything. Would probably want to get to the rim a lot and just end up clogging things a little bit too much for Zion. Not big on that. And this is where, There's no like this, perfect fit here, but. This is where like, I'm like, okay, if they choose Davian Mitchell, I could understand that. Or Corey Gisbert. I'd understand yeah yeah or that so, or franz wagner honestly or franz there's a wagner, couple there's if a, they wanted some defense there's a, yeah but i mean i think they have to get rid of some people you know honestly the new orleans pelicans is just i think the whole they do need to move on the, from blood so and from the whole van gundy thing i think he just like he left because i don't think it was gonna work out blood so you got adams you got what jackson uh you have like ingram it's just smorgasbord of people uh players on the new orleans pelicans which really don't make sense at all together uh, so i think they need to like try to move some players uh have a sense of direction i think that that's first of all um so giddy might make sense but also there's a ton of other players that might make sense they're really not that good of a team and i think you have to try to look at zion and try to build around zion right um so put some, yeah put some shooters around him or something like that because even at the end of this season he's playing point a lot so he's playing like point forward you know zion I, pre- I believe this is a discussion we've had on here but like is it possible that zion and ingram is aren't your forwards but they're your backcourt so you'd be playing zion more in like a power guard role similar to like a John Morant or a De'Aaron Fox where he would just be constantly slashing towards the rim trying to get get finishes and like just dishing out yeah and then yeah. you would have Ingram be your poor defensive but capable of making shots on the movement shooting guard and you would just have a very a higher bigger size backcourt and then you put some forwards next to it say like you know obviously in a perfect world you would you, I'm not saying get these players, but guys like these players, you would have like a Mikhail, an OG, and like a Miles Turner, like spacing five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably sense. the best way to play that roster, right? That makes sense. I think, um, yeah, something like that. So um, for number 11, the Charlotte Hornets choose Garuba. Yeah, this makes a ton of sense just because I, I mean, you're giving them a, an elite defender, probably the best defender in this draft to go with Lamelo, who, you know, despite the steal numbers, I don't think Lamelo is a good defender. People might try to tell you otherwise, but he's, he's not. And it's something that the Hornets have lacked that presence at the five, even just the four, because Washington has given them minutes as a small ball five and bridges can, it, it, they, they kind of do some interesting stuff when it comes to that. So if you could get like bridges, Washington and Garuba on the floor, I think they could just kind of do the five by committee, just boxing out, playing hard, and you play those three with Lamelo and one of the, you know, one of the guards they have in Rogier and Graham. And I think that's, or Monk. And that's a really, really, really exciting team to play. If they're fast, they play defense. And the thing with Garuba is that he's such an elite defender that he really doesn't need like a crazy offensive bag like that. He just really needs to be able to hit like that spot up corner three just to be a threat and that's about it just move around occasionally a bit get your man maybe cut to to, you know get your get your man open 
other than that, Garuba, he's, you know, he's a guy that because his defense is so good, he has to worry a little bit less about the offensive end. And he's already kind of doing it versus men in the best league. That's not the NBA, right? So he, he's playing in the best international league out of any international prospect. Right that is true. I like Garuba. Um, so we'll move on to, this is where kind of the big men go. So San Antonio Spurs, you have Alperin Sengun from Turkey going to. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is my maybe favorite fit of the whole draft. Especially if Pop can get Duncan back for like a summer just to teach him post moves and stuff like that, man. And just Pop getting on him for defense and the way Shingun already really cares and just plays so hard. And he's a good passer, which would just be perfect in the Spurs system. And I think they're so well built around him. I think a lot of people aren't evaluating Shingu in the right way, where they see him as a pure five that's going to play center all the time. It's just not true. He's going to be splitting his time at the four and five. He's got enough skills where he's not just this stupid run and dunk center, you know. He's he's obviously been a very talented passer. He's He's shown shot creation flashes that are more than just flashes where they're actually very, very believable. And he's a guy that, very obviously could be maximized in a Sabonis role because of, you know, his stature. He's, he's six, nine with a seven foot 0.05 wingspan, which just doesn't cut it. Because if you go look at centers that are under seven, one in the past decade, it's basically like Maurice Wagner and like the Plumley brothers. And like, there isn't really any success stories there generally to protect the rim at at least an adequate level, you're going to need, a wig span above six foot, uh, or six foot, seven foot one. So the fact that upper end doesn't have that is going to give him some problems on the defensive end. And I think the way to maximize him, like I said, is going to be how they play its bonus with guys that can move their feet. So they have the holidays and they have other guys, obviously that can play defense there, but also guys uh, or a specific center who's going to play next to him that could protect the rim. So obviously turn Sabonis has that, in Turner, but if you contrast that to San Antonio, Shangun would have Vassal, DeJounte Murray, Derek White, Keldon Johnson. These are all good defenders around him, insulating him all the time. And then he would also have that rim protecting five, which is uh, Jakob Poto. So I couldn't think, you know, if Shangun's going to have to start producing his own shot, that's going to be a big, big development thing for Shangun. And I do believe it because he's shown like step backs and high mechanical intense shots. And he's hitting 80% of his shots at the line. So it is believable that it's going to come around for him to work with Podal. It's going to, he's going to have to start shooting, but I do like the fit there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So with the Indiana Pacers at 13, you have Franz Wagner, uh, Michigan. Yeah. Franz. I mean, Franz might be both of our least favorite prospect to watch in this draft. Realistically, we've, we've kind of ragged on him quite a bit. It's just the issue with Franz is that when he starts to actually miss shots, he really gets in his own head. And this isn't just the March Madness stuff. This is, was a very consistent thing with Franz throughout the year where he would just pass up shots that he should absolutely be taking in the rhythm of the offense. And he's not. And that makes me really frustrated to watch. Sometimes, you know, Tyler's taking terrible, terrible shots frustrates me, like James Booknight, where he's just way too covered and he's taking shots he shouldn't because he thinks he's the man. But then sometimes guys who are just not taking their shots that they absolutely should, like Franz, that, that's also really, really frustrating to me. And I'm just not sure if, like, he has the athleticism and the, the you know, he is very, uh, how do I say this? He's very sound fundamentally, but he's not exactly a guy who's gonna i'm worried about how he's going to hold up versus nba athletes i guess is what i'm trying to say so he's a guy that while his game did look good in college i think he was a little bit overrated as a shot maker as well it's not something he could do really off the dribble all too well and i didn't really like i I just didn't really like his game i'm gonna be honest like he just didn't exude any confidence it was it was not the most fun thing to watch so yeah i just I, i find it very difficult to see Franz being anything more than a role player with his current mindset and skill set. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe runs in the family. Uh, Oh, but I definitely should have talked about the fit with the Pacers instead of just shitting on Franz the whole time. I just realized I didn't even. It's all right. I I mean, it's uh, it's okay. I mean, he's a good player. It just, uh, 
he'll slot in right yeah. he'll slot in basically at the three four and then you get to move Sabonis down to the five that's the idea and he'll be like a good defender that's basically the whole idea yeah I mean he's, uh, in all honesty I don't see him as like a one to five starting rotation for a long time I see him more he could be maybe like a six seventh man you know I could easily see him being that um but I don't know if he'll be like a full-time starter I might take that back but th- I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in college, yeah. He was a good we'll have to make a Franz Wagner apology podcast if he ends up being an all-star at some point in his career. I don't know if that's going to happen. But yeah, like... No, never, never, never. But I mean, these clips will be gold if he is. <laughs> yeah. So at 14, we have Corey Kispert from Washington. I mean, from Gonzaga. He is from Washington. Uh, going to Golden State. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy that while he wasn't the best... Mo- uh, while he wasn't the best motion shooter in the draft and far from it he is a guy that could at least run steve kerr's motion offense better than a guy like kelly Oubre could at the three right and even if he is just taking uh catch and shoot threes that's absolutely fine because you've got two great movement shooters and curry and clay on the roster already so what kispert gives you is kind of you have the present and you have the future in moody so you have kispert who can slot in right now with your roster play the three, be an absolute threat, and just be very good in Steve Kerr's motion offense. But then you have Moody who can be developing underneath him and you don't have to push him into that starting role immediately and pressure him. And that's why I really like that fit. I think that Kispert can, uh, of course, I do think the Warriors, I, like I said, I think the Warriors will trade this pick, but if they don't, uh, adding two guys that could give them some shooting uh, just as depth guys would be amazing. And the fact that you're bringing in Kispert so that Moody can come along at his own pace is even better. Heard. So that is the end of the lottery. I'll probably run through the the other ones. So, cause these were more a bit like detailed cause it is obviously the lottery. You're going one through 14. So yeah, I'll run, I'll run through these a little bit quicker and then we'll have some, uh, we'll have something to say after some of these picks. Cause these are, some of these picks are not, your typical picks that you see on major platforms, I think. And there's definitely some discussion to be had. So you have, to- yeah, like one sentence will do from here on out. So like Trey Murphy, the third for Washington at 15, they just need someone ready. Yeah. And then you have 16 Jaden Springer, Oklahoma city. They just need the best talent available. Who's going to be able to step in. Uh, BPA. I think Jaden Springer is the best talent. BPA. Basically. BPA. I think Jaden Springer is the best talent. They should just take him at 16, and, you know, I know they have a lot of guards, but fuck it. 17, you have Zaire Williams, Grizzlies. I mean, that's a normal Grizzly pick. They usually pick BPA and usually a player that slid, right? Yeah, and it fits them really, really well. I mean, you have Brooks and you have John in the backcourt. You have Jaron and you have Brandon Clark, and you have all these guys that are very exciting on that roster, Tillman and all that, but they kind of have that need at the three, so – you know, you you can bring Ted, you can bring Zaire up with that young roster, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Then you have Kai Jones at 18 for Oklahoma City again for one of their 9,000 picks this year. Um, yep, they kind of just need a big man, to be honest with you. That was the reasoning on that pick. Yeah, they traded. They Moses. need a big man, and Kai has very high potential. They traded Moses to the Celtics. Um, then you have Keon Johnson, the person who could leap out of any gym to the Knicks at yep. 18. Might be a little bit lower than most, but I think we both agree that Keon's a little bit overrated. Not a great handler, not really an amazing passer. Can pass, but not amazing, right? Uh, Not a top five defender in his own class. Not really skilled enough for the shooting guard. Not really uh, tall enough for the small forward. Best tool is the mid-range, but are they really going to let rookies take that? A lot of question marks with Keon. Then you have Davion Mitchell for Atlanta. Baylor, champion. Atlanta has an obvious uh, defensive need and this, he will go higher in real life, but this would be just such a perfect fit for the Hawks because their non Trey young minutes have been their biggest problem. Truth be told. You have Sharif Cooper, actually Cooper um, at 21 for the New York. Yeah. Knicks. I mean, 19 and 21, they have both picks. So it didn't really matter which one I sent them to, but Sharif Cooper to the Knicks has been one of the most covered picks in the entire draft. Uh, he's such a good fit. He wants to go there. He has liked tweets about going there, and they just need that point general or point point guard floor general. You have Bones Highland going to Los Angeles Lakers at twenty two. You have Rocco, last name I will butcher. 
for the Rockets? Yep. Uh, Roko Perkachin is, well, if you want to say it like uh, an American, just say Perkachin. But if you want to say it like a Croatian, you know, Croatian person, go, you go Perkachin. Um, but yeah, Roko, I mean, Roko and Thor, we can, we can just do these guys back to back because the reasoning is the same thing. Uh, the back, they have their backcourt set with Jay Green and uh, KPJ. They have their center in wood of the future and they kind of just need those forwards. Like they have uh, Jay Sean Tate, they have um, Kenny Martin Jr., but they do need sort of bo- better forward talent. And I think Ro- Roko is a top 10 talent in this draft. I've, you know, would we really do get to go in depth about some of these prospects more in a board style closer to the draft? I will go on about why I really, really like Roko, but I do think he's special. I, I think he's absolutely special. And if you haven't taken a look at Roko or catching enough already, go watch his tape. So you have, let's see, Jared Butler at 25 to the Los Angeles Clippers, which makes sense. Uh, they, he kind of just fall, falls because of the heart stuff. Uh, he should be going closer to the lottery, but we're not even sure if he'll be able to play into the, in the NBA right now. So that's why I have him there. Unfortunate. Um, so you have very unfortunate. So you have Josh Christopher from Arizona State going to Denver Nuggets at 26. Denver just kind of kind of needs that last guard to bring the put that final piece of the puzzle together, bring it all together with Jamal at the one. They need that two, and then you have MPJ, Gordon, Jokic, right? And Barton could be the guy that eventually gets upgraded upon. And I think that. Christopher would be a very good option to do that. He's an amazing inside finisher. I think he's already very mechanically talented and just getting that shot to come around is going to be the big thing for him. So you have Isaiah Jackson, Kentucky going to the Brooklyn Nets. Yep. And I think just adding more center depth to the Nets who uh, uh, DeAndre Jordan didn't look as playable as the season went on. And he hasn't really looked amazing in a few years. So just in case Reggie Perry or Nick Claxton get hurt and you don't want to be playing DJ, I have them taking Isaiah Jackson here because, I mean, Sean Marks seems to like having his big men on rookie contracts and then maybe not necessarily keeping them around past that. That's the, the, It's a very smart philosophical thing, I actually I, I, I think. If you have a late first and you have a team full of stars, just to take big men so you don't have to really pay them. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And then you have from an asset standpoint. Of course. Do you want to contest it? No, no, no. I mean, yeah, they're not gonna choose Isaiah Jackson. I think they're they'd rather go Kessler Edwards before Isaiah Jackson. I think on their board, you know, or even Chris yeah, Crystal uh, Warde, even, you know, shooting for I definitely see your point of view because I mean they 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 have Reggie Perry and Claxton and DJ. So I, I definitely see why you wouldn't want any more center depth and I, I I understand that if they would if they took a forward or a guard I wouldn't I wouldn't blink. Yeah, no, I I could see like a three and D type of dude definitely. Who are, who are your who are your favorites if you say your top three? I know you really like Bones. I like Bones Highland. I like Trey Murphy and I like Kessler Edwards in that spot. Yeah, so, yeah, those would also th- those would all be really good picks. Even even Cam Johnson. Cam Johnson is if he's or not Cam, jo- Cam, Cam Johnson. Cam Thomas. No, no, Cam Thomas. Cam Thomas. Uh, which. Leads us to the 28th. A lot of Johnsons in this draft. Leads us to number 28, Cameron Johnson. Oh, Cameron Johnson. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> it's because there's yeah. there's a Keon Johnson and there's a Jalen Johnson in this draft. It's uh, Cameron Thomas from LSU to the 76ers. Yep. And, I mean, this is kind of doubling up again. So, uh, the more I think about it, the more I regret it. Uh, I would actually almost consider swapping these picks, the Nets and the, the Philly pick, because... I feel like Philly might already have a ton of guards with George Hill and Maxi, and just they kind of might be, you know, Seth Curry, and they might be a little bit loaded to take uh, Shake Milton. They might be a little bit loaded to take on Cam Thomas at this point. So I, I'm not sure where his minutes would come from. But the, the idea was just to add more spacing around uh, Embiid and Simmons. But in retrospect, I might swap the Nets pick in this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they do have a lot of uh, just cards. Because, yeah, so it would be- just because I believe they traded away. Uh, What's his name? Tony Bradley as well. So he was he was a pretty good backup center for them. I'm pretty sure they traded him away to OKC like halfway through the season. So yeah, I could see them taking like Isaiah Jackson as backup center there. Um, so 29, you have the Phoenix Sun choosing Chris Duarte from Oregon. Which, yeah, makes sense. 
guy that's just ready to compete now didn't even show up to the combine because he clearly has a promise in the first round which i find interesting so yeah i think he had a he had prior to, be, to the to the workouts he had a, or he already had a promise um yeah he didn't even so he knows he knows he's going in the first had to include him in the first if he's going to go to any team right he's going to go to a i could see him very well going to your nets i could see him going to the lakers i could see him going to the clippers any contender really makes sense for chris duart um just because the dude's going to be 24 coming in the draft he's going to be like the same age as devin booker so you're going to want him on a team that's ready to go now and he doesn't really make sense for a younger team that's rebuilding so yeah no that totally makes sense i see him i think 15 through 20 he'll go in, in that in that range 15 through 20 yeah and it's always good to have more solid wings on your roster right like if crowder if crowder starts to fall off or something then it's always good for the Suns to have options there. So they, they, they've been a fan of just getting depth wings before. We've seen that in Cam Johnson, just getting guys who are going to be solid and they know are going to be solid. So, Yes, and now we have Kressler Edwards with the last pick of the first round to the Utah Jazz from Pepperdine. Yep, I'm a big fan of Kessler Edwards. If it was up to me, he might even be going in Trey Murphy's 15th spot right now. But, you know, teams don't seem to be as high as I am on Kessler. I think Kessler is probably a top five defender in this draft. He's just so uh, so quick on his feet for his size. I was surprised, you know, at the combine he moved a little bit better than I thought he would. But the, even though the shots weren't going in, I think he's a guy that will provide so much value to a contender as a guy who is able to hit his shots because i think people who were evaluating kessler's shots missing in the combines you're just not looking at it right like the guy has two years of sample that have shown he's a good shooter you know i I was looking when i was looking at kessler in the combine or other guys for that matter i was more looking at things that they hadn't shown me in the regular season because shots are just some guys are going to miss shots someday right like it's not really something i should be looking at I, I, we've got huge samples for the season and Kessler showed me that he can move his feet a lot, a lot better. And I might've been something he was working on in the season. So I've been very impressed with him. And I think that any, honestly, he could go to a contender or he could go to a team that, cause he's only, I think he's only 20, right. Or 20 or just freshly 21. So he's still a guy that's young enough that could go to a team that's, that's rebuilding, but he's, he's just a great fit all around for any, any franchise, really any franchise needs a Kessler Edwards. Yeah. And that is a wrap to the 2021 uh, NBA draft. That is version one for court setters. Uh, so for the next topic, we'll just have some uh, discussion about the Phoenix Suns versus the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, who do you have? Who do you have winning? Who do you have winning? Tell me now, now, now. <sighs> I think the Suns are going to win, man. I do. I really do. Uh, Suns, it'll in four. Be- Suns in four. Suns in four, Suns in... No, I think it's going to be a seven-game series. I really do. I think it's going to be a really fun seven-game series. I think Giannis is going to come back, but he's going to be hampered. And, I mean, everyone's hampered a little bit right now, right? Chris Paul, I think, has some, like, torn ligaments in his hand or something. And, like, he was having... everybody's... Chris Paul was having a hard time versus Patrick Beverly. I think he's going to be in a nightmare situation versus Drew Holiday. If they decide to put yeah. him on him, yeah, it's going to be a nightmare for him. But but I, honestly, if I'm the Suns, getting Drew Holiday on Chris Paul might just be a win. Yeah. Is it I, not I, just a win? I mean, I would. It takes it off Devin Booker. Middleton will line up with whoever's whoever forward the Suns are playing. And then they'll have to put Giannis on um, Giannis or Brooke on. Aiton is the biggest key to this series. I think it's whoever like defends Aiton. Is it going to be Brooke Lopez? Is it going to be because Brooke Lopez is a little too slow for Aiton? Yeah, I feel like it's going to be Giannis. And then Aiton's going to be too small for Brooke Lopez, even though he's huge, you know? Yeah. And man, it's just, it's going to be tough because Giannis still has like an, a hyperextended knee. So I just don't know how well he's going to be able to hold up against Aiton. I think Aiton's really going to feast. And, you know, a lot of people are saying that Chris Paul's going to get that finals MVP, but there's a really good chance Aiton or Booker comes away with it, I think. Oh, they're going to have to put Chris on McHale. That's who they're going to have to put Chris Middleton on, obviously. McHale? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's one of them, too. Yeah. But it's also like Jay Crowder has been killing. Like, if you let Jay Crowder shoot threes and he's making them, he's just like a... I wouldn't say he's a killer, but he's like um Like, he could start a run or he could end the run, you know? So, I think he's one of those key on the fence players that I think you could look over and be like, oh, Devin Booker or Aiton. But if Aiton, if um, Jay Crowder is hitting threes, that team is more dangerous. Because if you remember versus the Lakers series when he was so off, Jay Crowder, like they were struggling. Mm. They were really struggling. They had to kind of like switch yeah. in and out. 
Um, yeah. So I'm gonna. It's gonna be interesting seeing the matchups being played. Jay just plays with so much energy too. When he's hitting threes, it's just contagious for the whole team. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, remember what LeBron was doing to him? It was crazy. And then just Jay started dancing back. Yeah, he's just. He's he's crazy, man. I, I I love Jake Crowder, but I think the big swing point for this series, personally, is going to be Mikhail Bridges' defense on Chris Middleton, because, you know, the Bucks, they've you know they've needed that score that secondary scoring, and Chris Middleton has really really stepped up to the plate in these playoffs, especially with the absence of Giannis, he has been really really good and. I hate how it was a narrative that Chris Milton was bad in the playoffs before, because if you go look at his stats, he actually wasn't like bad at all. He was pretty efficient in the playoffs. It's kind of just a media narrative. Like if you go look back, even, even before this postseason, like Chris Middleton has been a decent to good playoff performer. It was generally just bled. So absolutely breaking down every off season. So just, oh, and so. Middleton's really taken it to that next level. He's been able to carry them, but if Mikhail Bridges is able to do what he's been, you know, doing to most players this season and just absolutely locking Lock. them up, putting them in, putting them in Mikhail jail, as people call them. Mikhail jail. Uh, Man, I think I just don't know where the secondary scoring from the Bucks is going to come unless Drew Holiday plays great. And like Drew Holiday has had some really questionable offensive games this playoffs. I just don't know if, if, if Mikhail starts to lock up Chris, what are the Bucks going to do? Yeah, like Brooke I don't, has I don't think Mikhail's game. gonna lock up Chris Middleton, just to let you know. I think uh no? nah, nah. I think that is gonna be a big swing point though. I don't think he's gonna lock him up. Like Chris Middleton is gonna get his points because I think there's so much concentration paid to Giannis if he does play and stuff like that. Um he just gets buckets. In all honesty, he hits tough shots over people. Could be he was hitting shots over like Durant, dude. So I think yeah, yeah like Chris Middleton's no joke and he's 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 honestly uh, I wouldn't say he's like a one. Maybe he's going to one, but like he just hits tough shots, dude. Fadeaways, over fading. I think he's getting more aggressive as the playoffs have gone on, like driving in because he needed to be. And then Drew Holiday, yeah, I think Drew Holiday over CP3. But the Devin Booker Drew Holiday thing is going to be interesting for sure. Um, How much do you think Bobby Portis is going to get paid this offseason? That has been an interesting storyline to me in these playoffs. I think he's not going to get paid a lot, but I think he's going to come back to the Milwaukee Bucks if they do win it, you know? You do? He has a $3 million player option. You think he accepts that? I don't think he accepts that. I think he says, I mean, guys, I want more money. I, know, so I, I think to your he, full taxpayer exception. He's, he's been, I think he's been interviewed and he said, like, you know, Milwaukee changed my life, changed my career. Like I owe everything to Milwaukee, and also like they saved me as a like as an NBA player because I was kind of lost for a while. It's true, it's true, it's true. It really is true. He could have been at a he league, you know. Great. It's almost like Cameron Payne. He could have been at a league as well, you know. And I think yeah. it's funny because he, he's in the team that the same team that uh, he he punched the dude in the jaw with, you know. I he, like man, you know, like he's in the he's he's in his team, like the. So it, it is kind of like a weird circle for him. Also, both these teams, both these teams, uh, had Corey Craig, Corey Craig at, at one point this year. So, you know, they both had him this year, which is also fine. I, I, man, I just the, the reason I ask this is because I've been seeing Kings fans crying and just yelling and screaming on Twitter. Please sign Bobby Portis. But that's I like, want if, my yeah, but they, they, I mean, come on, bro. That's like, and I'm just like, King, no. Kings Twitter is like, that's for everyone, dude. That's for everyone. Kings Twitter is, man, Kings Twitter has been pissing me off this week with the Franz takes and like the, the veiled racism. And, but you know, either way. I think, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting because also both these teams ha- at one point held, had uh, Eric Bledsoe, and now they're in the championship without Eric Bledsoe. So that's that shows you how far they are from the Eric Bledsoe. And where is Eric Bledsoe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yo, he was bad. Eric Bledsoe was bad. So anyone that – I saw <laughs> – you know that tweet you dropped on the Suns where it was like, I don't want to be here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw, I saw an edited picture of that. And it was like about the Bucks, and it was like I want to be there. <laughs> uh, uh, oh no! Yeah, but I think it's gonna. He really be, fucked his career. It's gonna be interesting to see about the Phoenix Suns and and the matchups because 
I think the key might be the Aiton versus Brook Lopez Giannis thing. It's going to be very interesting. It's such a cool series, man. Nobody cool would series. have expected the finals. No, no, man. I don't know. I mean, I and just I thought Phoenix... the storylines of it, man. Like CP could have been in a Bucks uniform. Like it's just crazy. Thought, the whole thing is crazy. I thought Phoenix had a chance to go to championship after they beat the Lakers. I was like, yeah, they could go to championship. And then Milwaukee after they beat Brooklyn. I thought Brooklyn was the best team in compared to the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, and once the Milwaukee Bucks beat him, I was like, yeah, they have a certain – I don't know what it was this year, but previous years, I think if they got uh, pushed, they wouldn't come back up. And this year, they, you know, they, they, would, they would bend, but they wouldn't break. So I think that's the interesting part, and they punch back. So it, it, previous years, they weren't doing that. I think that's a good sign for a championship team. So we'll see. I mean, even with Giannis out, it is still kind of interesting because Brook Lopez has gone back to like Brooklyn, New Jersey, Brook Lopez. So um, still, he really has. Yeah, it's great. It's and been he's some vintage, bro. It's also like he's just huge. He's just a fucking huge human being, you know. So there's not a lot of players in the NBA that are as big as Brook Lopez, and I think he was just dominating Atlanta in the inside, and they couldn't do anything about it. Are you cheering for the the Bucks because of that? Yeah, I mean they beat the Brooklyn Nets, but I do like Brook Lopez because he is. Uh, uh, basically one of the best Nets players ever. So I always cheer for Brook Lopez, even when he's shooting against us. Um, so you're cheering for Brook. Actually, not honestly, really I, I like, I like, or, so, sorry, not really the Bucks. Yeah. I, I'm not really cheering for anyone. I think whoever wins wins. I, I think as a child, I used to watch a lot of Phoenix Suns games because of Charles Barkley, Marley, Eddie Johnson, stuff like that. So big fan of the, the Phoenix Suns. And I'm interested to see, who wins this series i don't know about the whole like cb3 media hype train thing i'm like cb3 cb3 i don't really like you know i don't i don't think i ever put so much um i don't know, feelings inside of one player you know like oh i can't believe i you know like yeah he should go to the finals or yeah i'm so happy cp overrated have you seen that cp overrated account on twitter no i mean that's like every account it just it's got like, banned it's like every account on on twitter is is like you know, MJ overrated, LeBron overrated, CP3 overrated, but I there's just, one account that just will not shut up about CP3 being overrated and they've been slandering him forever and they just got, they got banned today and everybody on everybody on Twitter was celebrating. Ban hammer. No, I mean, like, I think so, but I think people there are saying, like, CP3 is, like, one of the best, like, top three point guards of all time. I'm like, oh. you know, like, he's good, but I don't think he's, like, top yeah. five, so... Uh, you don't think CP3 is a top five point guard? All time? I don't know. I'd have to look at an all time list. I haven't really thought about it. I don't, I don't, I mean, even off the top of my head, probably not. But maybe if he wins a championship, yeah, in conversation, right? Yeah, I think he's definitely in conversation if he wins a championship. But otherwise, it's been a lot of good, you know, really good Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, uh, QAnon supporter, John Stockton, Curry four um and then from there maybe one more player i'm trying to think of like um maybe yeah maybe but i'm people saying like you know chris paul chris paul is one of the best uh, is the best you know it's uh, okay i get it i get it it's like we're, we live in the moment so i totally get it um but yeah the, the series is gonna be interesting i think monty williams thing is interesting he's the better coach <laughs> <laughs> definitely the better coach uh what do you think about that one play out of bounds with the alley-oop did you go crazy did you watch that play go down uh the game winner of course when he when fucking Aiden just threw it down off the out of the alley-oop that shit was bananas but also Bud is a shit coach that's all i'm gonna say about that so i mean the viral treat that i had was about Bud not knowing how to coach right Giannis and then he wins too i mean i don't know if he won you know oh yeah actually here's a here's an interesting talking point that i saw online um if bud loses in the finals is he still fired yeah yes i think he's fired dude y'all fired you think he's still fired i don't think he's fired but I'm, maybe it actually depends on like how far they go if they're swept or like four one yes i feel like if they like if they lose in four or five probably but if they lose in six or seven i don't think he loses his job it's a winner go home i think it's a winner go home situation for him which is crazy. Damn. Which is kind of like, it's interesting as well, because 
This is a, you think they gave a promise to Darvin Ham to take over? This is a he, great team, and I think there's been a lot of there's been a lot of quotes from players as well, like, "Oh yeah, Darvin Ham, he's ready to be a coach. He's awesome. He's great." I remember that one game, like Bud wasn't coaching, he coached, and he did such a great job. So, I feel like little footprints are put, being put there, man. So, it, it same system. Man, they better they they better act up soon because Darvin Ham's taking interviews with Washington. He's one of their four finalists. True that this is true. So yeah, I mean. It's gonna. I have. I have no idea who's gonna win the championship. In all honesty, if Giannis that scares me. By the way, Eric, I just want to say that scares the shit out of me. If Giannis is, if if Darvin Ham has gone off the Bucks next year and it's purely Bud, like say they say ownership keeps around Bud and they lose Darvin Ham next year and he Darvin Ham's not in Bud's year anymore. Holy crap! Is it gonna get? It's gonna get really bad, isn't it? Yeah, maybe it might be. It might be a little bit bad, you know. Cause it's like. They're going to lose their most talented assistant. And if they keep the shitty man, it just might be bad. Anyways, what were you saying? Yeah, I was just saying, I just don't know who's going to win between Phoenix and Milwaukee. That's like, um, I really don't know. Usually, sometimes I have like a pulse. I'm like, hey, I'll go with this one. You know, I'll go with that one. Um, Parody, man. But it is Beautiful thing. It's a really interesting thing. But um, the Giannis question is the biggest question of all. If he plays, I think the Bucks could win it. If he doesn't, I don't think they could win it. That's basically it. I think even if yeah. even if he's at 75%, 75% of Giannis is better than a lot of 100% players in this. 0% of Giannis. Yeah, so I mean, he, honestly, I'm I'll be it's crazy that he's even partaking in, pl- in practices and stuff after the hyperextension in the knee, you know. Yeah. Well, uh... I guess it depends how bad the hyperextension is because I think Tyrese Halliburton um, hyperextended his knee, in that that ended his season. But he was able he was able to come back on the court in like a week and a half. Joel Embiid so. had a bad one this season, and you know it was kind of similar. Like he landed weird after a dunk, and his knee kind of went backwards. But I feel like the the worst part about those injuries is when your when your knee goes sideways, right? I think I feel yeah. like that's when people absolutely that's when people hurt themselves like tear an ACL, MCL, stuff like that. I remember uh, Isaac did that, and I, I met, like he like pro hopped uh, the knee went kind of sideways. Even Kawhi Leonard, it went kind of sideways. So I feel like sometimes because that ligament is a joint and it's just a ball socket, it does go forward and backwards. Sometimes if it does go forward a little too far, or if it goes too backwards, you don't you don't really hurt anything, but you are going to be out for a little bit. I mean, nothing serious, right? Hyperextended, like it's almost like an elbow. If you, if your elbow goes all the way back, sometimes it doesn't break. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, it was, it was a weird play.